Tonight, breaking news, the criminal trial of Donald Trump. The first witness takes the stand and what now happens first thing tomorrow morning. Tonight, the prosecution's first witness facing the jury, David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, who prosecutors say was part of a scheme called Catch and Kill, buying unflattering stories about Trump and making sure they were never published before the election. Eric Gutersky outside the courthouse. The near disaster at JFK Airport, authorities say air traffic control clearing four planes to cross in front of a passenger jet as it was about to take off. The pilot aborting takeoff, you'll hear calls to the tower. Tonight in New York City, Columbia University increasing security. Pro-Palestinian demonstrators rallying against the Israel-Hamas war. The school switching to remote classes. And tonight, protests spreading to campuses across the U.S. In Los Angeles, the break-in at the home of the mayor, Karen Bass. Authorities say the mayor was home when the intruder broke in and got to the second floor. They say the mayor was hiding in a safe room. Tonight, Ukraine's President Zelensky thanking the U.S. and thanking House Speaker Mike Johnson. After the House passed, Democrats and Republicans, a massive aid package for Ukraine, angering some Republicans. Tonight, the Marine killed during a training exercise. The sergeant was killed just weeks after being promoted. The Carnival cruise ship rescuing more than two dozen people stranded at sea. On this Earth Day, Ginger Z travels to Navajo Nation tonight, where 60,000 people live without power. Tonight, the effort to bring clean solar energy there. And we're there as one woman turns on the lights for the first time. And the major news tonight involving Cher. After being passed over for so many years, it's about time. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to start another week with all of you at home. We do begin tonight with the first witness taking the stand in Donald Trump's historic criminal trial here in New York. The former president facing 34 counts of falsifying business records for allegedly covering up a hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels to keep it all from voters just before the 2016 election. The former president says none of it is true and he has pleaded not guilty to all charges. Trump walking into court today. Prosecutors outlining their case accusing Trump of election fraud, pure and simple, they said today. Trump's lawyers saying, quote, there is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy and that none of this was a crime. Then prosecutors calling the first witness, David Pecker, to the stand, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, who prosecutors say was part of a scheme called Catch and Kill, buying unflattering stories about Trump and never publishing them. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leading us off at the courthouse again tonight. Donald Trump walking into the Manhattan courtroom where today, for the first time in history, a jury heard testimony in a criminal case against a former American president. It's a very, very sad day in America, I can tell you that. With Trump slouching in his seat and sometimes closing his eyes, prosecutor Matthew Colangelo began his opening statement charging Trump orchestrated a criminal scheme to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. Jurors listening intently, some taking notes as the prosecutor laid out his case, accusing Trump of falsifying business records to disguise a $130,000 hush payment to porn star Stormy Daniels days before the election so voters wouldn't find out about her claim of an affair. At the time, Trump was under pressure. News had just broken of the Access Hollywood tape. Trump caught on camera bragging about groping women. The prosecutor today quoting Trump's own words to the jury. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. You can do anything, the prosecutor slowly reciting to the jury. Prosecutor said the tape's impact was explosive, and Trump and his campaign were deeply concerned. So when Trump learned Stormy Daniels was shopping a story of their alleged liaison, prosecutor said he was adamant it not come out, fearing it could have been devastating to the campaign. Prosecutors allege at Trump's direction, his fixer Michael Cohen paid Daniels off and agreed to cook the books. So when Trump reimbursed him, it appeared as routine legal bills. The prosecutor called it a conspiracy to influence the 2016 election to help Donald Trump get elected. Election fraud, pure and simple. In his opening statement, defense attorney Todd Blanche insisting President Trump is innocent. President Trump did not commit any crimes. I have a spoiler alert, he told the jury. There is nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. There is nothing illegal about entering into a non-disclosure agreement, he continued, period. He said Trump was unaware of any effort to camouflage the payment to Daniels as a business expense, and he told the jury Michael Cohen, a key prosecution witness, has an obsession with getting Trump. He cannot be trusted. But prosecutors insist the alleged criminal conspiracy to protect Trump involved others. 
including their first witness, David Pecker, the former National Enquirer publisher who once called Trump a personal friend. As Pecker took the stand, Trump leaned forward, arms crossed, an angry look on his face. Pecker has acknowledged buying negative stories about the candidate only to bury them, a practice known as catch and kill. On the stand, Pecker was blunt. We used checkbook journalism. We paid for stories. He's testifying under a subpoena, having cut a deal with prosecutors to avoid charges himself. He was only on the stand a few minutes today, but he'll be back tomorrow. Leaving court, Trump, who denies the affair with Daniels, tried to downplay the case against him. It's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law. So David Pecker's back tomorrow, David. But before that, there will be arguments whether Trump violated the judge's gag order. Prosecutors say he disobeyed it repeatedly by posting disparaging things about witnesses like Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels. Prosecutors want Trump to pay a fine. They also want the judge to hold him in contempt, which could lead to even more severe consequences. David, a lot of this focused on this first thing in the morning. Aaron Katursky, Aaron, thank you. We turn now to what authorities say was a near disaster at JFK Airport. Authorities say air traffic control clearing four planes to cross a runway just as a passenger jet was about to take off. The pilot then aborting takeoff. You'll hear the calls to the tower. Here's ABC's Ike Ajachi. Tonight, the FAA is investigating a near disaster at one of the nation's busiest airports. An April 17th Zurich-bound Swiss air flight cleared for takeoff at JFK, beginning to speed down the runway, forced to abort after noticing air traffic control also cleared four other planes to cross that same runway, putting them on a collision course. Listen to air traffic control clearing Swiss Air Flight 17. Swiss 117, four left, there for takeoff. Then, moments later, as the plane is headed down the runway, the pilot suddenly sees the other planes taxiing and aborts the takeoff. Tonight, the Swiss airline praising their quick-thinking team, saying in a statement due to the high level of situational awareness, a potentially dangerous situation was quickly de-escalated. Moving four aircraft across an active runway uh, and one controller not talking to another indicates a special level of stress. The incident came just a day before another near catastrophic close call. Panic in the tower at Washington's Reagan National Airport as two packed planes came within 400 feet of each other. A JetBlue flight cleared for takeoff, forced to slam on its brakes after air traffic control noticed they cleared a southwest plane to taxi across the same runway. David, while the FAA investigates this latest incident, they're also addressing fatigue concerns for all air traffic controllers, increasing the amount of rest between shifts. David? Ike Ajachi right here at JFK Airport. Ike, good to have you in New York. Tonight here in New York City, Columbia University increasing security as pro-Palestinian demonstrators rally against the Israel-Hamas war. The school switching to remote classes and tonight protests now spreading to campuses across the U.S. ABC Stephanie Ramos at Columbia tonight. Tonight, college campuses scrambling to handle a growing pro-Palestinian protest movement. Columbia University stepping up campus security and moving classes online. The school's president saying we need a reset to de-escalate the rancor. But today, fresh arrests and tensions boiling over on the first night of Passover. This Israeli assistant professor confronting university officials over being denied access to the main lawn as school officials try to separate protesters. I am a professor here. I have every right to be everywhere on campus. You cannot let people that support Hamas on campus and me, a professor, not go on campus. Let me in now. It comes after a campus rabbi urged students to stay home, saying the school and the NYPD cannot guarantee Jewish students a safety. New York Mayor Eric Adams saying he is horrified and disgusted with anti-Semitism spewed at and around Columbia's campus. Pointing to videos circulating online, such as this one showing a woman in front of pro-Israel protesters with a sign reading Al Qazam's next target, a reference to Hamas's military wing. It made me sick hearing the things they were saying and doing. Um, so over this holiday, I kind of just want to try to avoid it as best as I can for my own safety. Many pro-Palestinian protesters insist their movement is peaceful. Violence has no place on, on this movement, uh, and we regret some of, some of the uh, incidents that has happened uh, that were actually unassociated with, with this movement. This 
The protests calling for colleges to divest from companies with ties to Israel now spreading to other campuses. Today, at least 45 people arrested at Yale University. At NYU, a standoff with police after protesters were told to vacate a campus plaza. Back here at Columbia University, students are still waiting to hear when they can return to in-person classes. New York Governor Kathy Hochul, who visited the campus today, calling on people to find their humanity and have conversations so they can understand different points of view. David. Stephanie Ramos reporting from Columbia for us again tonight. Stephanie, thank you. This evening, we're learning more about a scare for Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass. Police arresting a suspect for allegedly breaking into her home while she was there. The LA Times tonight reporting the intruder made it to the second floor. The mayor was in a safe room. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, Los Angeles investigators working to determine whether the alleged break in at the home of Mayor Karen Bass was a targeted attack. Units responding to incident 1065. The alarm was personally activated. The LAPD saying early Sunday morning the suspect smashed through a glass door. The mayor's office telling ABC the mayor and other family members were inside when it happened. The LA Times reporting she hid in a safe room as the suspect made it to the second floor. The advisors, uh, Subject inside the residence right now. Officers on the scene within minutes arresting 29 year old Ephraim Matthew Hunter, booking him on a felony burglary charge. We have one in custody. You're clearing the house right now. Court records show Hunter was previously charged with kidnapping and attempted murder back in 2015 in Massachusetts. He was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon, sentenced to five to seven years in prison. The mayor today declining to reveal details of this new investigation. Let me just say, uh, first of all, I am fine. My family is fine. And uh, we are going to do everything we can to keep Angelino safe. David, the mayor was already the victim of at least one other recent break in, but that wasn't at this house. And of course, the big question now here at this home is whether this was targeted or whether it was random. David. Trevor Alt, live in Los Angeles for us. Trevor, thank you. Tonight, Ukraine's President Zelensky expressing relief and gratitude to the U.S. and to the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, after the House approved a massive aid package with votes from Democrats and Republicans. It comes after some Republicans threatened the Speaker's job if he moved forward with help for Ukraine trying to fend off Russia. ABC Selena Wang on Capitol Hill tonight. Tonight, with that $95 billion aid package finally making its way through Congress, a new lifeline for Ukraine in its war against Russia. President Zelensky saying in his evening address, I am grateful to Mr. President, his team, everyone in the United States Congress, personally to Speaker Johnson, and all who support the active defense of freedom. Zelensky speaking to President Biden by phone today, Biden vowing to sign the bill into law as soon as it reaches his desk. But tonight, Russia's foreign minister warning the Westerners are teetering dangerously on the brink of a direct military clash between nuclear powers. The bill is passed. It comes just days after Speaker Mike Johnson put his job on the line to pass that aid package in the House. Nearly $61 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, and $8 billion for Taiwan. Plus, legislation that would ban TikTok if its Chinese parent company doesn't sell the app. You do the right thing and you let the chips fall where they may. It's a dramatic 180 for Johnson, a devout Christian who was staunchly against aid to Ukraine. But after classified briefings and lots of praying, Johnson making a complete turnaround, arguing that Ukraine is critical to U.S. national security. But hardline Republicans fuming with at least three still threatening to oust him. He's uh, disappointed us. He can't be speaker. And David, this $95 billion aid package is expected to speed through the Senate, and there's bipartisan support for that potential TikTok ban in there. But look, it could be a long road from here because TikTok, they will block, they will try to fight any potential ban in the courts, and the Chinese government could block any potential sale. David? Selena Wang, live up in the Hill Force tonight. Selena, thank you. Meantime, in Israel tonight, the Israeli military intelligence chief has resigned over the October 7th Hamas attack and the intelligence failures leading up to that attack. The first senior figure now to step down, Major General Aharon Haliva, resigning the Hamas attack, the deadliest attack in Israeli history. Hamas had been training for it for many months. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said he and other officials would answer to the intelligence failure after the war with Hamas. Back in this country tonight and on this Earth Day, our series, The Power of Us, People, Climate, and Our Future. Tonight, Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z takes us inside Navajo Nation, where after a lifetime without power, new and clean solar energy is allowing some to turn on the lights 
for the first time. Along a seemingly incalculable horizon, a legacy of energy injustice hangs heavy over Navajo Nation. The house that we just saw back there, you were telling me they are one of the homes without power. Yeah, so they built these power lines, you know, for others, but not for us. There are 15,000 households, up to 60,000 people here that have never had power. Hi, pretty. Like Eleanor Paddock. Brett Isaac is trying to change that. One thing that always upset me kind of growing up was being able to witness how close we are to opportunity, but yet not actually touch it or, or have access to it. That's why out of that frustration, I created Navajo Power. Navajo Power has a mission. You gotta check out your right here. Bringing clean energy to families who have lived without electricity. Eleanor moved back to her family's land 11 years ago. I'm getting emotional about this. Aww. She uses propane to cook, a car battery to charge her cell phone, and sometimes she drives more than an hour just to plug in and make lesson plans as a substitute teacher. As we drive to her home, Brett tells me and about the Bennett cases. freeze. It essentially closed off parts of infrastructure. The federal law that made it nearly impossible for parts of Navajo Nation to develop their land until it was lifted in 2009. No water, no home renovation, no electricity. Was there malice in this? I have, how do you tell someone you can't connect to the world this, until the year 2009 well, without this some... Is, this is when they were trying to create incentives for Native people to move to urban areas and essentially assimilate into it. Today, Brett and his crew that's the base. Yeah, so we have, this is our, our racking and framing equipment. Are installing solar at Eleanor's traditional Hogan. Okay, push star, mm -hmm. and then you're gonna put in that number. And then, the moment that so many of us take for granted. Eleanor hitting that light switch for the first time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Oh my. How does that feel? unbelievable <laughs> being out here and having lights out nowhere <laughs> her food going from the barn into a refrigerator for the first time those power lines looked a lot different as we leave eleanor's home it's not only an eyesore it's a reminder yeah that the limitations are still present and the, the, the battle is still ongoing to find solutions. Using solar allows us to have access to the amenity, but minimize the burden and the impact of the land. It's by people from here, built by people from here, and for people that are living here. Brett and Navajo Power hope to get up to 500 off-grid homes a year and take a dent out of all of those people that still don't have electricity. But they also have a giant solar farm project planned right here on old uranium land, where they'll utilize this to power more than 200,000 homes and bring the revenue right back to where it's needed. David. Ginger, thank you for kicking off this special week-long series. So glad you were there as Eleanor turned the power on for the first time. We mark Earth Week all week with the power of us, innovative solutions for climate change across ABC News and across our ABC stations. It's all week right here. When we come back tonight, the Carnival cruise ship rescuing more than two dozen people stranded at sea. Also, the E. coli alert tonight involving ground beef and the major headline involving share tonight. It's about time. Tonight, the Pentagon has now identified the U.S. Marine killed during a late-night training exercise near Camp Lejeune. Sergeant Colin Arslanbis died in an accident last week. The incident is under investigation. He had just been promoted to sergeant weeks ago. A Carnival cruise ship has rescued more than two dozen people adrifted a boat between Florida and Cuba. The Carnival Paradise sailing from Tampa to Honduras, saving 28 Cuban nationals. They were taken on board and checked by a medical team, the ship contacting the U.S. Coast Guard. When we come back here tonight, the new health alert involving E. coli concerns with some packages of ground beef. 
and the news on share tonight, which is long overdue. To the index in tonight, the Department of Agriculture has issued a public health alert for some ground beef products possibly contaminated with E. coli, produced in March and sold in a number of grocery stores nationwide. They have a use-by, freeze-by date of April 22nd, and the establishment number is 960A. The problem was discovered by the Greater Omaha Packing Company. Packages should be thrown away or returned. When we come back here tonight, what do Cher, Cool and the Gang, Dave Matthews, and Ozzy Osbourne all have in common tonight? ABC World News Tonight with David Muir, sponsored by Chase for Business. Make more of what's yours. Finally tonight here, the new inductees to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the class of 2024 spanning generations. Baby, Cher will finally take her place in the hall after years of being overlooked. She recently said, quote, I wouldn't be in it now if they gave me a million dollars. She's in tonight. Cool and the gang like me celebrating tonight as well. In fact, Robert Cool Bell, the last surviving original member, telling Rolling Stone he's overjoyed. It's been 60 years. We finally made it. Among the other inductees tonight, Mary J. Blige, the Dave Matthews Band, Foreigner, Peter Frampton, Ozzy Osbourne, and a tribe called Quest. By the way, the induction ceremony takes place in October and will stream live on Disney+. Plus. We'll be watching. I'm David Muir. Thank you for watching here on a Monday night, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow. From all of us here, have a good evening. Good night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.